Y'all know you talking about six new times for cloud and look who y'all representative Jay Song to put ten to shake get you know going to the champion at the sun east I think Paul do not go to Jimmy she town like you be to tell up or van ha bong twin cities new start to go to Jimmy time in the time we are to see uh we check in a sign of cut me about not the town of good doctor eat to อ่าในหมู่คือเชคกับนักวิชาอินิเวอร์ซิตี้อเมริกาตัดดอกเตอร์พีเตอร์ไลซิงตัวอ่าชิตันซูตัดชิโนโมยตูกัมมอร์ที
Um, she's uh, very familiar with processing deer, and she's a, I would say she's a better shot than me. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say, say that at all, but um, just know that I, I come from a, a rural background, a hunting background as well. But um, after like, growing up on the farm, I wanted to be involved with biology. So I went on uh, in my graduate school to get my PhD in molecular biology. And I was down at Texas Tech University. My postdoc was on actually Alzheimer's disease at Duke University. And there's some really interesting connections between Alzheimer's disease and chronic waste disease. So when I came here to the University of Minnesota in um, August 2018, I knew, uh, uh, based on what I was seeing, that chronic waste disease was an emerging issue. We needed to have researchers at the University of Minnesota focus on this disease and think about it from different ways. So everything I talk about tonight, just know that there's a larger team of people, a broad team at the University of Minnesota, who are really focused on CW research and outreach. Um, Mark Schwabenlander is here today, he's in the back of the room there. Uh, Tiffany Wolf, and then we have many professors, many faculty and staff who every day, every day, are thinking about chronic waste disease. We're thinking about um, uh, new methods, new ways that will help us fight the battle against CWD. So just know that there's a broad team out there. It's no, nothing's done in isolation, right? We need to work together um, to confront this disease. Okay, so the outline of the talk, I'm going to cover what chronic wasting disease is. Many of us hear about CWD and we hear you know, reports about how maybe it's moving around the state, but the biology of the disease, like truly like understanding what the disease is and how it spreads, it's really important and that's part of why I'm here tonight. I'll cover where CWD is in the U.S. and in Minnesota, and then what we are doing about CWD, we being scientists at the University of Minnesota. So what is chronic wasting disease? Well, I can tell you what it's not. And it's not a zombie deer disease. So every time that you see this, zombie deer disease, just, just know that this is, this is not in line with the slide I showed you earlier about deer heritage, okay? This is alarming, this is scary. You're not gonna wake up at night and go out and see a deer with red eyes and fires burning behind that doe, okay? So this is a product of the media, and we want to avoid this when thinking about CWD, because it uh, causes undue fear. Okay, so we can't think of this as a zombie deer disease. That's clickbait. We need to think of this uh, for what it is. CWD is a progressive and fatal neurodegenerative disease of cervids, okay? So CWD impacts all cervids, caribou, elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, even moose, okay? so there's that group of, of deer and, and, and species were closely related to deer called serpents. So it's not caused by a virus or a bacteria. That's another um, misnomer that's out there. It's caused by a misfolded prion protein. And I'm going to talk about what that prion protein is. I'm going to try to illustrate that in a way um, that uh, you may not have, uh, have seen before. Because that's a diff it's a difficult concept. Most of us are familiar with, with diseases caused by bacteria or viruses. This is something different from talk about why that is. But CWD was first identified in Colorado in the 1960s. And I'm going to show you a map of, of the U.S. and you'll be able to see a cluster in Colorado. This is thought that uh, there's mule deer that were uh, held in a pen with sheep that had scrapie. Scrapie is another prion disease. Um, and it's thought that that occurred. The, uh, uh, the contact between those deer and the sheep that had scrapie was the flashpoint, was the initial cause of CWD and it got out into the wild and spread in Colorado and now it's spreading elsewhere. It all happened, uh, it's traced back to Colorado in the 1960s. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But CWD belongs to a family of prion diseases. So this is a mouthful, they're called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs. So when you think about CWD, you should be thinking about scraping and sheep. You should be thinking about BSE or mad cow disease in cattle, crutzfeldt jakob disease in kuru in humans, CWD in deer. These are all connected. These diseases are all connected. They all focus on a pathogenic prion protein. Okay, so CWD isn't something that is outside of, you know, completely new. No, it's, it's connected to this family of prion diseases. And that's really important to understand because it helps us understand CWD um, uh, in different ways, ways that are connected to these other diseases. So all involve prions. How many of you have heard of prions? All right, 
right? Prions. How many really understand what a prion is? I, you know, it's confusing. It's confusing. We, we hear this term a lot, and, and whenever you ask someone, well, what's a prion? So, I don't know. You, you know, you, you just don't, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand what that is and visualize. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to understand that together. So, turns out, all mammals, all mammals have prion proteins. Okay, and so prion proteins are part of normal cellular function. Uh, this is a ribbon diagram. This is what scientists, they, they can look at, at proteins and, and their shapes using diagrams like this. This is what a normal prion protein looks like. And every one of us, all mammals, we all have this right now in our bodies. It looks like that, it's normal. These prion proteins play a role in uh, uh, processing copper and metal in the body, and they're enriched. They're enriched in the nervous system. Okay, so one of the reasons why, right away, that now that we know that we have normal prion proteins that play a role in, cop in copper metal processing, they're enriched in nerve cells, you can see how if something happens to that, then maybe the, neuro the nervous system could be negatively impacted, okay? So CWD, remember, it's a neurodegenerative disease. All right, so one way that you can think of this, and this credit goes to my wife, Roxanne, she's a fantastic scientist, and she is a great science educator. She thought of a way to connect, a uh, uh, way to understand these CWD prions differently. Because you have to think, when you think about this disease, you have to think three-dimensionally, okay? So think of a slinky, this slinky here. It has a function, right? See it's how it's coiled like that, and it's a spring, and it can, you know, if I were let to go downstairs, it would go down the stairs. So this is a nice, well-functioning slinky. Think of this slinky as the normal prion protein. This is what we all have, okay? But what happens in CWD is this. CWD prion is misfolded, misfolded. We always hear about prions as being misfolded in CWD. Think of this slinky, it's not functional, it's a mess. Right? It's a jumbled mess. It's misfolded. This is the CWD prion. It's no longer functioning. It's no longer able to do copper and metal processing in the nervous system. Okay? It's misfolded. So this structure here uh, on the, on the right-hand side up here, that's showing these, this sheet, these sheets of protein that are all gummy. They're stick, they're stick together. Okay? CWD proteins are uh, uh, misfolded and they stick together. When you see this, when you think of CWD prions in this form, think of a shield. This is shielded, okay? This is shielded. So as, as these loop together and they form this mess, this gummy three-dimensional structure, they become almost indestructible. When we hear about CWD prions, we hear that they're, you know, they can survive in an environment for many years, that they uh, are difficult to destroy. You, can, you, know, you can't, you can't um, cook them away, right? They're, they're really resistant to degradation. They're shielded. And it's because they take this shape change, these sheets and sheets. Okay, so this is the, the indestructible CWD prion. Okay, if a CWD prion, this mess here, this misfolded form, touches this, this is our nice, normal functioning Prion. If this comes into, in a deer, if this touches, it will turn this into the misfolded form. It causes the shape change. Just these two molecules coming together. These two molecules come together and it will convert this into this shielded misfolded form. Think of it as this is, is highly structured, it's beautiful functioning, but when it touches this, it it assumes like a, it causes this molecule to go into a relaxed state. It forms all these sheets. Okay, it's a domino effect. So the way that CWD spreads is you have a misfolded form, it comes into contact with this normal form, and then it causes that to change shape, change the shape into misfolded form. All right? So I call that I call that the chaos engine of CWD. The reason why it's the chaos engine is this, this horrible domino effect. So you have a misfolded form, it comes into contact with the normal forms, converts those, they come into contact with these normal forms, converts those, and ultimately you get into a disease state. It's the chaos engine of CWD. 
So how does that domino effect, how does that domino effect cause wasting and death? CWD got its name, right? Look at these, look at these animals, they're wasting away. They're wasting away. So this daisy chain, this domino effect, can cascade and cause that wasting effect. Okay. And how that happens is, that misfolded form slowly spreads through the lymph and nervous systems. Okay, so lymph system, that's a system that the body has, that deer have, that all animals have. It's part of your immune system. It helps, if you, if you see something strange, if your body sees something strange, it sequesters that into the lymph system. So that's a clue about why we take um, lymph nodes to test for CWD. So that missile form slowly spreads through the lymph and nervous systems. It begins to clump together, forming fibrils and plaques. So this, remember, this is the misfolded form. It's gummy, it's sticky, right? And then it comes into contact with other prions and converts them, and they stick together. So it starts forming these uh, uh, groupings, these plaques. It's similar to Alzheimer's disease. Those plaques, as they form, they cause cellular death, and the nervous tissues are especially vulnerable. Because, those, because these normal prions, remember, they're enriched in the nervous system, the nervous system of the deer, okay? When they start being impacted and converted to this, all of a sudden, the nerves become vulnerable because they're just enriched there. And so here's an image of the nerve. It starts getting all these CWD um, plaques forming, and boom, you have cellular death, neurodegeneration. Okay. The body, the reason why, we, we, we know that CWD takes a long time to occur. Like animals uh, that are affected, they may not show symptoms for up to two years, right? Long time, slow. The reason why that is, is because when the deer's immune system sees this, it's like, okay, that's a little strange. We'll put that in a lymph node, but we're not gonna amount a big inflammatory response, right? You're not gonna have uh, a, a deer showing, you know, fe running fevers and things like that. Think about when we get sick, when we get sick with the flu. You're not gonna see those similar symptoms because the body, the, the, the deer system views this as, this is a little weird, but it's not scary enough to, to develop a immune response, inflammatory response. Okay, so that's probably the reason why it takes so long for the disease to occur. Okay, so there we have this chaos engine, this daisy chain event. Those CWP prions slowly build up and they spread in the lymph tissues. This is why, so on this image here, all these little green dots here, those are lymph nodes. Those are lymph nodes. There's a reason why hunters pull lymph nodes for CWP testing. Right, this is that retropharyngeal lymph node that many of you have pulled. The reason why you pull that and submit that for testing is because over time, the, deer, the deer's body is pulling those misfolded forms, it's sequestering, it's putting them in the lymph node, saying, this is strange, I'm gonna put you here, and it becomes, they become enriched there. They become enriched at all these lymph node spots throughout the deer. You could take any one of these lymph nodes and test that for CWD, and it, it could have just as much as a retropharyngeal, but this is one that's easy to get to and it's, it's pretty obvious to see. I mean, not so obvious, it's difficult to see that when you're trying to <laughs> dig around in there, right? But um, once you know what to look for and you know what that variation looks like, uh, it's, it's easier to pull out than some of these other lymph nodes, okay? So that is why, that is why you're pulling out lymph nodes and submitting them for testing. All right, so because, because we know that those CWP prions, that misfolded form, we know that uh, prions are enriched in nerve tissues, right? That, because they're associated with nerve tissue, that provides a highway. Think of it as routes, highways within the deer. Those highways are nerves. And there's, there's some nerves that are tied into the intestinal tract. One's called the vagus nerve. And it comes up and it goes right up here, right? It's a highway straight to the brain. So if a deer ingests, let's say, a CWD positive uh, material, I'll talk a little bit about transmission, but if a deer gets exposed maybe um, uh, to uh, saliva of another deer or they're licking each other, it's, it's likely that they can ingest, they get those prions into, right, into their stomach. 
Well, you have all these nerves that innervate, all these nerves that tie into that intestinal system. And when that daisy chain starts happening, the daisy chain you just spread, 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 boom, you have a highway right to the brain. And when it gets to the brain, you start to have cell death. So think about a normal brain, normal deer that's uh, not impacted by CWD. Think of that as a slice of American cheese, right? This is a, a, a section of a normal uh, white-tailed deer brain, okay? Pink, CWD-positive deer brain um, that may be around you know, 1.5, two years into the, into the infection. Think of that as Swiss cheese. That's what that slice is showing here. You can start to have all these little white spots there. Those are spots where the nerves have died away, right? They're disappearing. You have holes. You have holes in the brain of the deer. The deer starts wasting away, right? Okay. So, how is CWD transmitted? It's spread by bodily fluids via direct or indirect contact. What does that mean? So, deer are social animals. That's one thing that we all know about deer, right? So, they like to group together um, in herds or in their rut, and they have bucks, you know, fighting it out. So, there's plenty of opportunities for individual deer to get exposed to these misfolded prions, right, from positive animals. And that can come in the form of saliva, blood, urine, feces, right? Deer are bedding down. Even the carcass. If, if a deer, if a CWD positive animal dies in the forest, then that carcass can become a source of prions for other animals, okay? So, because deer are social animals, and given the nature of how those CWD deons, uh, prions spread, you have this worst case scenario, right? You have the resistant form that's shielded that can spread and cause, start causing a domino effect, and because, you know, their sociality, that, that can spread quite easily. And this ties into the DNR's response plan. I'll talk a little bit about that. So, now, those, that shielded form, this shielded form, remember, it's resistant degradation, it can remain infectious in the soil for years, maybe 10 years, okay? One common theme across all prion folding diseases, one common theme across uh, the United Scrapey and mad cow disease and CWD is ingestion, getting that material into the mouth somehow, swallowing it. Okay, there is a paper, there's been a few studies now uh, showing this. You can take uh, CWD positive material, let's say a CWD positive brain, mix that in with soil. And they've done this experiment where they've uh, um, raised uh, wheatgrass in the soil that has the CWD brain material in. The plants will, that prion molecule is small enough, the plants will bring that in through a, a micronutrient pathway, we think. They'll bring those in, up, and then those prions can be in the leaves of the plants. So in this experiment, they raise the grass in that CWD positive um, soil. They took a clipping of the leaf, they fed it to their hamster model, the hamster developed uh, neurogenic disease and died. And I guess that's why the hamster's sideways here. Okay. So, <laughs> That is, that's a really important study. It's scary, it's alarming, I know. But it's so important because it might tell us something about how this spreads, okay? Because it's not, it's not easy, it's not always 100%. We don't always know when an animal gets CWD, even in a farm situation. We don't know what it was consuming, where that came from. Think if that were to happen in, in some um, alfalfa, okay? So it's very, very complex. Know that plants can take prions up from the soil. That's an area of research that we're really, really uh, keen on, on jumping into. Okay, I'm going to show you, this is a video, an animation that we put together uh, at the University of Minnesota that highlights everything I'm talking about. And um, I think it'll be nice for you to visualize. I had this, I had a dream about this video, and I woke up last, like, February, and said, we need to make an animation. We need to, to develop this to connect with people, so we'll see if this works for Ben's turn. Chronic wasting disease can easily spread in nature, and it can take up to two years for CWD to kill an infected animal. But why is that? 
CWD is a prion disease. Prions are a type of protein that are commonly found in healthy animals and humans, but can be misfolded into dangerous infectious prions. Infectious prions can also be transmitted through and remain in the environment, such as in soil, food, or water. Transmission routes are very complex, but one way that CWD can be transmitted is through a healthy deer ingesting these infectious prions from their environment. For example, a healthy deer is exposed to the misformed CWD prion proteins by eating grass that contains an infectious prion. This infectious prion can travel through the deer's esophagus and into its stomach and intestines. As misformed prion proteins come into contact with normal prion proteins, this physical contact can cause the normal protein to change shape and become the pathogenic CWD form. Misformed prion proteins multiply in the body of an animal and continue to travel throughout the body. The prions can spread from the intestines to the lymph and nervous tissues, traveling up the spinal cord. Eventually, infectious prions will colonize the brain. As time progresses, the animal begins to show symptoms. The most obvious visible sign of CWD is weight loss. This whole process can take a very long time, up to two years. Throughout this entire time, CWD infected animals are shedding infectious prions into their environment through their saliva, blood, feces, urine, and even antler velvet. Eventually, the animal dies. The carcass of the animal will decompose and become part of its environment, but the infectious prions that were inside that animal remain. The grass that grows where that animal died will contain infectious prions. And eventually, another animal will eat that very grass, which has become a source for another cycle of CWD infection. Okay. So that gets at the complexity of this issue, right? If we have prions in the environment and that we can become sources of new infections. How do we manage that? How do we manage that in a heterogeneous landscape like what's down in southeastern Minnesota, or to be honest, what's throughout most of our state? All right. So it can take up to two years before obvious symptoms. Those symptoms include weight loss, increased drinking and urination, excessive drooling. Right? But that happens. It happens later in the disease. So you can see an animal that's perfectly healthy that's CWD positive, but maybe those prions, think back to that animation, how they're moving through the animal, how they get up into the brain, that process takes time, it takes time. So you may be early on, you won't see these. So also loss of awareness, no fear of humans, decreased social interaction, so you get to those phenotypes the later. If you ever see, if you ever see an animal that looks anything like this, it's, that's acting abnormal, or looks like, okay, hey, wait a second, that that looks like it's not getting enough food or you know I, <laughs> default mode report it to the dnr tell them tell them where it is okay it's really really important that um anyone out in nature hunters hikers everyone if they see if they see animals that look abnormal let the dnr know there's also because of this loss of awareness no fear of humans um uh it's likely that in cwd endemic areas things like roadkill right animals that are are just wandering about, you know, that, that those, those animals, like roadkill animals, they, it's important that they get tested, right? Because they have this loss of awareness. Okay, so uh, CW gets its name because um, these animals literally waste away. All right, so this is a really, really important question, one that we always feel. Can <coughs> humans get CWD? Well, okay, so there's no confirmed cases of CWD in humans. There is evidence that CWD can be transmitted to other species. The USDA has done a study where they showed pigs, a certain percentage of pigs can actually be fed CWD material and they can develop a neurogenitive prion disease. Some really distantly related monkeys, spider monkeys, these are, 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 are monkeys or primates that are very, very distantly related. Not chimpanzee or macaque, we haven't shown, those experiments haven't shown or they haven't been published showing that um, that species that are most closely related or cousins of us can get CWD. So it seems like there's some species barrier, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But there's growing concern of a human transmission. There's growing concern. We don't really know 
if CWD can or cannot infect humans. And there's multiple reasons for that. So I'm going to highlight one of those reasons right now. It goes back to this misformed stinky here. There's something called CWD strain variation. Strain variation. This shape, this misformed shape, it's not identical, right? If we're all deer in here, right? Let's say we're all deer. We all have CWD. Our prion proteins are going to be slightly different in shape. You have to think about it three dimensionally. So like this, like this, like this, right? And each one of those forms is pathogenic. Okay, so that's strain variation. That shape can change. We don't know which one of those strain variants can match a human. Right? One of those strain variants might be able to match our prion. Just like, think about uh, uh, BSC or mad cow disease. There are humans that, that died, and I have a slide uh, showing that. There are humans that, that died after consuming those um, uh, misfolded prion proteins from cattle. So the question is, is there a shape out there um, in deer prions, it's misfolded, that is a match, is a match for humans? We don't know that yet. All the data that we have so far suggests that that doesn't, it's not occurring, right? But we don't know. We don't know because CWD is spreading to new areas, to new deer populations. All right. So the CDC, because of that, because we don't really have a good understanding, there's a lot that we don't know about this disease, CDC says avoid eat, uh, eating CWD infected meat. It's estimated that between 15,000 and 20,000 CWD positive deer are consumed in the U.S. annually. That is uh, projected to increase 20% per year. Why is that? It's spreading to new areas. It's spreading to new areas. Um, we, the, the, we don't have diagnostic tools. The diagnostic tools that we currently have aren't capable of detecting early infections, right? So you may have a, a, a test that comes in that's not detected, but they're not, they may not be capable of um, identifying those prions uh, uh, in an early infection, right? Uh, infection that's like, you know, months. Um, it can take days for a result. So this is one of the biggest problems. You submit your, your, um, your deer to be tested, and it could be days, it could be days, maybe even a week, two weeks. What do you do with that meat in the meantime? What, what do you do? Do you have, is it, uh, are you able to, to house that in the freezers? I mean, this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem in the state right now, right? And the current diagnostic tools we have, it's difficult to process thousands of samples that need to be tested. So there's a bottleneck there. There's a bottleneck. When you get your result back, it's not detected. It's not negative, it's not detected. So there's a critical need right now to develop advanced diagnostic tools, and that's what our, our team is doing right now. Okay, so we need to have better tools to detect CWD, detect CWD in early stage infections, and to prevent uh, CWD contaminated meat from entering our food supply. Bottom line right now, though, is that we don't, um, there's no evidence of human transmission. When you think about that issue, think about this. There's lessons learned from uh, BSC or mad cow disease and scraping. Think of this spectrum here. We have a spectrum. On this end of the spectrum, there's mad cow disease. There's an outbreak in the UK, 1986. 177 people died from that. They ate uh, um, uh, meat contaminated with these misformed prions that come from cattle. 177 people died from that, and some are still passing away from that. Okay, they're still passing away from that because that slow process. Some individuals that, uh, that are passing away from this, they have a, a, a genotype, a genetic background that makes that process happen very slow. Okay, so we know that there's a problem there with BSE. But at the same time, think about scrapie. We've known about scrapie since 1700s. 1700s. There's no evidence, no evidence of a human transmission in scrapie. And there's a lot of mutton consumed around the world, okay? So think about uh, uh, CWD is somewhere on this spectrum. We think it's, based on all the data that we have, that it's somewhere over here in the spectrum, that it may not cross over into humans. What we don't know is what strains push it over into here, okay? This is playing out right now. This is why we need more research in this area. All right. So, CWD is a neurogenic disease caused by misfolded prions. 
When you think about prion misfolding, think about these slinkies. You have this nice functional slinky, right? But if it comes into contact with this, this formed one, right, it can cause it to misfold. So think about, about those slinkies when, and, and use that. Use that when you're talking with other people about what a prion is. Uh, it's impacting this also, it can impact all servants, elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, caribou. Okay? We really need to have more research to look at CWD risk. We need to understand what that certain variation is like um, uh, in, in certain populations throughout North America and Canada. All right, so where is CWD? Where is this disease uh, in the US or in North America? Okay, this is a map from the USGS. So uh, you can access, this is a great resource uh, from Brian Richards, USG, uh, USGS. So if you just Google like uh, USGS CWD map, you'll have access to this. And they update this like weekly. So this is uh, the latest one from December, I think just a few days ago. Remember I was talking about the disease originating in Colorado. When you look at this map, see these dark colors? This is showing where CWD was prior to the year 2000. So this is the epicenter of the CWD outbreak. And we, we, uh, all data that we have should, uh, suggests that CWD originated from Colorado in the 1960s. Okay, so since the 1960s, it's been spreading. It's been spreading throughout uh, North America. These dots, these dots are really important. Every yellow dot is a CWD captive facility that's been depopulated. Every red dot is a CWD captive facility um, that has not been depopulated. Those gray counties, the gray counties are showing where CWD is, has been detected in the wild. And this could be like mule deer, it could be elk, it could be white-tailed deer out here, right? So this is the current status of where CWD is in the US and Canada. And look, up, look what's happening in Canada, right? They're, they're going through a, a large CWD outbreak as well. Okay, so CWD is spreading. It's spreading, it, it, since the 1960s it's spread eastward, now it's spreading westward, north, south. This is a huge problem. All right, so 26 US states and three provinces, Canadian provinces, both wild and farm deer. This is the resource for these maps. It's just a great, great, uh, um, uh, just check on, if you're interested in this spread, check frequently at this USGS, um, Brian Richards, on, on, on their website. It's also been detected in South Korea, Norway, Finland. South Korea, um, there was uh, a transport of CWD positive, uh, I believe, deer from, uh, white-tailed deer from Canada to South Korea, unknowingly, and then it's shown up in South Korea. Uh, there's also sporadic cases. It can pop up sporadically. I don't have a good understanding of how or why, and there's some cases in Finland that are like that. Okay, this is a growing problem. Where is it at in Minnesota? First case was in Aiken County, Aiken County in 2002. That was an elk farm, and it's shown here in this map. And I'm just going to cover what what's, we're learning now. The DNR will talk a little bit more about this after I finish. But uh, uh, since in spring, and so in 2019, in spring, there's a Crow Wing County. There was a certain farm there that had positive CWD animals, and then we found a CWD positive uh, wild animal outside of that that farm. Um, in Crow Wing County. Since July, uh, mainly in southeastern part of the state, I think entirely in the southeastern part of the state, there's been six suspect animals, 12 positive animals down there. Just today, just today, the CWD positive farm, small farm, um, we got news from the Board of Mental Health that two, the, I think one, one animal tested positive, they're, they're looking at the second animal, but that just happened here. Okay, and this is, it's frustrating for lots of reasons because when we, when we start having positives in new areas, the, in the DNR, you look from them, that requires resources. They need to go out there, we need to understand where it is. Is it, is it out in the wild population? How do we contain that? How do we limit the spread? Okay, so it's really important to follow the DNR and the Board of Mental Health for the latest info. All right, if we do nothing, if we don't do anything, CWD will just continue to spread slowly. Think of that map of the US, think about if it originated in Colorado and it's sort of spreading its tendrils out like that, we'll see that happen in our state. And the reason why is you'll see this flow along riparian uh, 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 areas or, or edges of rivers and streams.
places where deer travel and congregate. They're always moving across the landscape. I think there was a study from the DNR uh, recently showing that there was a doe that traveled something like 60 miles, right? It goes on the sojourn, like, right? And just think about what that means. If you're an animal that's CW positive and you're sprinkling prions around as you go or interacting with other deer as you go, that's really difficult. That's a, that's a, a, a very difficult um, problem, okay? So this is why. This is why the DNR response plan is so important. This is why those management zones, target calling, all that. It's really critically, critically important that uh, we support those efforts because it's, right now, it's the only tool that we have to try to combat the spread. We have to try to take those positive animals out of the environment. We have to. Until, right, the only thing that we have that we can hope for beyond their, their strategies is to develop new technologies, maybe new therapeutics, that's, that's um, far down the road and requires intense research effort. Okay, so because of that shielded form, prions can uh, cause environmental contamination. This is why man managing that spread is super crucial. Infected deer can spread that into the environment, this shielded form. That can further be spread by scavengers. So a coyote, a coyote can come. They've done this experiment in Colorado. A coyote can consume uh, a CWD positive animal. Those prions, they won't infect the coyote. They won't cause a disease in the coyote. But they are re remain infectious in the coyote's feces, okay? So just that, that animal can move those prions to different parts of the environment. And because of that shield form, they can remain infectious in the soil and uh, the vegetation for some amount of time. There's studies showing that in the soil, different soil types uh, matter. So you have a, a more clay or loam soil or sandy soil those prions interact differently in those soil types and they can remain infectious for anywhere from, I guess, two years up to 10 years, okay? All right. So CWD is spreading throughout the US and Canada. It's a looming crisis for all aspects of deer heritage. This disease is a direct threat to the heritage. Think back to the first slide to show you the, the beautiful uh, diversity of, of servants there. It's a threat to that. Is there, what's the environmental risk? What is the environmental risk of of CWD in areas in our state. That's something that we need more research on. Okay, we need to have a better understanding about how uh, um, CWD positive animals, these populations that are from this part of the United States, here in Minnesota, what's their CWD strain variation like? And how does the regional environment, with the soil types, the diverse habitats across the state of Minnesota, how do they, they handle these CWDs? What's uh, CWD prions? What's an environmental risk? And we, we really have to work aggressively to slow and stop the disease. All right, last few slides here. What are we doing about CWD? I'm italicizing we and I'm underlying, I'm underlying doing because, so I'm, I'm uh, with the University of Minnesota. I'm a researcher, I'm a molecular biologist, right? What can I do? When I first got here to the University of Minnesota and I saw how critical this issue was, I said, wait a second, I think I have some skills that I've learned along the way in different universities that I can apply to this problem. Think we can think outside the box. So what are we doing? What are scientists like myself doing to confront this disease? All right, so outreach and education is really, really important. That's why I'm here today. But CWD requires an immediate and intense research effort. We need to throw everything we have at this. We have any hope of slowing it down. So that requires lab work and field work. It requires people rolling up their sleeves, getting to work in the laboratory setting, doing the molecular biology that you know, myself and my team knows how to do, right? But it also requires going out into the field, working with the DNR, trying to view the situation through the DNR's uh, eyes, working with servant farmers to try to understand what they see, what are they, what are they seeing? We, there's all stakeholders, everyone that's, that's working on this disease or is concerned about this disease, we need to come together, look at those and learn from each other, okay? So we need to take all that information but it's really important to get out into the field, look at the, this diverse, heterogeneous landscape to try to figure out, okay, if we're gonna confront this disease effectively, when you have uh, you know, like 30 or 40 deer per square mile, how are you really gonna do that? Okay, so coordination with all stakeholders. I think that's really, really important. So we're, I'm uh, in the College of Veterinary Medicine. There's a large group of us. There's broader, uh, uh, um, a broader unit at the University of Minnesota interested in, in helping with CWD outreach especially, but uh, the Center for Animal Health and Food Safety, there's a center of, of, um, present of individuals that are helping to uh, put together materials, educational materials, much of what you see tonight as far as a handout has come from that center. But 
what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to organize and establish this Minnesota Center for Pre-On Research and Outreach, we're calling it MinPro. I view this MinPro as an incubator, an incubator for cutting edge pre-on research. We need to think outside the box. I think of other universities, I think of like MIT, places where we have an environment where we bring our best minds together, people that can think about this issue in new and different ways, right? Interdis interdisciplinary teams. When, they, when those people come together and they think about how to problem solve and develop new strategies to fight CWD, that's when you have huge leaps forward. Okay, you need to have people to think about this in a, in a new and different way. So we have around 15 to 20 faculty uh, right now who are signed on to MinPro, and we're all brought together to devise innovative technologies, strategies to combat the spread of CWD. This is a big, big problem. Lots of, lots of projects. Um, our, our first uh, uh, research is focused on developing new diagnostics. We know that is a critical issue. But under that MinPro uh, umbrella of MinPro, we need to also look at soil predictive modeling. We need to understand how those CWD prions interact with the different soil types and environments in Minnesota. We need to devise ecological remediation strategies, carcass management, vaccines, and therapeutic development. I think, based on, based on the work that's been done in Scrapey, Okay? I think we can learn from that, and we can get to a therapeutic approach or a vaccine. This involves developing blocking molecules. We can develop molecules that will block that daisy chain from happening. If you develop a molecule that prevents this from interacting with that, then you might be able to stop the spread. And that involves some really intense molecular biology, but I think that we can do it. Okay? So we need action on those research topics. Okay, number one research priority, new diagnostic tools. Hunters endure too long a wait time for their CWD test results. This is why we need new diagnostic tools. We need to provide you all with the result uh, much faster. We need to develop tools that can provide a result within hours, not days or weeks, okay? That'll provide a real-time view of where CWD is in Minnesota, and we have to prevent CWD venice from entering our food supply. We don't want to test that barrier. We don't want to see if there's a particular strain that does fit with a human, right? That'd be horrible. So we need to prevent that from ever even happening by developing um, novel diagnostics and launch research projects in that area. Okay. So we have a website up, CWD Watch. The link is there and many of the handouts that we have over there. Um, there's a CWD Hunter's Toolkit with information of how you can use bleach, for example, to decontaminate stainless steel. Uh, and so the toolkit that we put together. There's videos, the animations up there, and that's, there's also a link to that um, on YouTube. And we have uh, talks available, right? So we have these materials coming out now, and um, I'll just point you out to that website, and it's, uh, that website's also over here, and this material on these tables. Okay, so it's important to understand CWD is not a zombie deer disease. If you ever hear people saying that, resist, push back. So now you know a little bit more about the biology of CWD. You understand a little bit more of how it spreads. That causes fear, it causes fear. We don't need that when we're trying to protect deer heritage. So CWD is a serious threat to deer heritage, Minnesota and beyond, throughout North America. Okay, just understand that it's slowly spreading throughout North America and we really need to figure out ways to combat that. It's caused by prions, not bacteria or viruses. Experiments have been done and replicated again and again, showing that this misformed preem protein, that's the infectious molecule, okay? So we all have to work together to confront CWD. If you see a sick deer, report it to the DNR. Visit the DNR's uh, website, the Board of Animal Health's website, for, for guidelines, most recent guidelines that we should be following. And I really think that scientists, such as myself, we have some great individuals at the University of Minnesota that can come together and really think of new strategies, uh, new technologies that we can develop to fight this disease. All right, last slide. So just remember this. Remember this. Don't let that, that fear get at you. Don't think about um, um, you know, uh, these animals as zombies. No, we need to protect this heritage. Humans have been interacting with servants around the world, around the world, for many, many, many years, and we need to protect that. That's a new threat by CWD. So many people uh, to thank. Thanks, um, Cups and Cheers, for hosting us. Reps Lee, Zhang, Eckerfin, Hansen for um, pulling.
pulling this together, for asking, they reached out recently to try to pull this together, and I, I think it's incredibly important because now we have materials, we have translated materials, we can come up with a strategy to, to um, uh, connect to this community. Funding sources, so I really have to thank the Rapid Aid Response Fund, uh, the legislature for, and through LCCMR, for supporting that we've secured over $2 million in the last year to support the development of new diagnostic tools. Just know that that research is ongoing right now, um, and we have this great, great uh, flux of, of funds to be able to support that. Many people to thank. Thank you all for being here today.